Hey Cosmic Beings, it's Keon, director of The Dark Cosmos. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story, and remember, stay cosmic. My name is Jonathan, though my friends call me John. I used to work as a deep sea diver doing government work until the accident. After that, no one wanted to hire me. A man with a criminal record working for the authorities? Give me a break. Not even private outfits wanted me. Life was hard for a few years. Money was tight. I spent a good few months without a roof above my head. And I even considered taking my own life. It was in this desolate slump that my new employers contacted me. Now I won't bullshit you or drag this out. I work for a criminal ring operating out of Asia. I'm part of a crew they have whose only job is recovering things from the deep sea whenever they tell us to. The things we bring up can be pretty much anything. Evidence that they don't want the authorities to find. Merchandise lost in a shipwreck. Even ancient treasures, sometimes. I don't care what the job is, to be honest. I turn a blind eye to their more nefarious activities. All I care about is that they pay well. Yesterday, we were contacted with a new job. Details were sparse. A Chinese government ship had capsized in the middle of the Yellow Sea. For some reason, no rescue operation had been mounted and the ship had sunk within an hour. There was something on board that our employers wanted. A sealed metal box marked with several symbols in Mandarin I couldn't read. We were to reach it as quickly as possible recover it, and get out before the Chinese government send their own retrieval mission. We reached the site at around 5 p.m., just as the sun was going down. Our contacts in China said we had about four hours before the authorities arrived with the equipment for a dive. Four hours. That was an amazingly quick response time, considering they'd seen fit to let the ship sink. We would have to be quick. Our man in the sea that day would be Thomas. He was a living legend in the criminal world, a veteran of hundreds of dives and dozens of daring recoveries and heists. He had more experience than the rest of us combined, and so he was the obvious choice. I helped him gear up. Gone was the high-tech equipment of my days working legally. No submersibles, one-man subs, or guided robots. Back to the basics for us. Because of the death we would be operating at, Thomas couldn't wear scuba gear. Instead, he had an improvised modern iteration of the old style pressure suits. Those big, bulky things you pumped with air to deal with the pressure of the seafloor. Unlike those, however, it didn't have to be connected with the surface with a long air tube. It also sported a radio link to the surface and basic life sign monitoring tools. Ah, the wonders of the 21st century improving in some of the oldest gear in this field. You ready for this, man? I asked, making sure the seals on his massive round helmet were secure. This is a real deep one. Thomas grinned behind a round faceplate. He beat his palms around the sides of the helmet, amping himself up. Yeah, John. This'll be a cakewalk. We'll be back on land in time for lunch. I smiled. Thomas's bravado was contagious. And besides, he was right. For someone with his levels of experience, this mission was nothing. I ran down the checklist of safety checks one more time, and then, satisfied all was as it should be, patted him on the shoulder. Good luck down there, Tom. He smiled at me before turning around and stomping his way to the winch system on the side of our ship. It would lower him down to the seafloor and hoist him back up once the objective was secured. I walked quickly down a flight of stairs into the bowels of the ship and made my way to our makeshift control room. My colleagues were already there. Li, a former Chinese deep sea scientist, and Haley, another diver turned criminal, just like me. The four of us, including Thomas, made up the skeleton crew of the ship. Everything set? Asked Haley. She would be manning the radio today. Yeah, he's ready. I answered taking a seat at one of the two computers we had in the control room. On screen was a blueprint of the ship we'd be stealing from, the Yao Hai. I didn't know how we'd acquire this information. It was my job to navigate Thomas through the vessel to his target, nothing more. 
across the table. Lee gave me a thumbs up. He'd been monitoring Thomas's vitals and, and oxygen levels today, as well as operating the winch. All set here, he said. Haley, contact Thomas. We're ready. Haley thumbed on the radio and brought the microphone to her mouth. Tom, this is Haley. Ready for insertion? Ready, came the crackling response. Bend me down. Roger that. Lee triggered the winch controls. There was a whir of metal resonating through the ship. Thomas's depth reading began dropping. It took him 15 minutes to reach the bottom. We kept in contact throughout, getting updates periodically. Everything seemed to be working fine. Finally, Thomas reached the seafloor. Status, Thomas, Haley said. Can you see the target? Roger that, Thomas answered. You guys lowered me right next to her. Good job. On what side are you? I asked, scanning the blueprints. Haley passed the question along. I'm actually standing next to the deck. The Yao Hai landed port side up when she reached the bottom. Okay, look for the control cabin. I see a short path to the cargo room from there. I navigated Thomas through the ship. He really lived up to his legendary status, operating in pitch blackness with just a helmet-mounted lamp. He made quick progress through the vessel, reaching the cargo hold in only 20 minutes. Can you see the target? Haley asked. Steel box, yellow writing on top? Negative. There's something in the water. Some sort of dust or brine or something. I can't see much. Give me a moment. We waited for about 30 seconds. Finally, the radio crackled to life again. I can see it. You won't like this though. It's open. The impact must have broken the seals. Lee swore under his breath. Shit, is there anything around you? Anything that could have fit in the box? Maybe we can still recover it. It'd be something at least. No, nothing here. Hang on. I'm seeing something. There's some... The radio buzzed loudly with interference. Haley frowned. Thomas's voice cut back in, barely comprehensible with static. His voice, usually calm and collected, was suddenly tense. Oh God, what is that? Without warning, the radio cut out completely. Silence fell on the control room. Thomas? Thomas, come in! Haley called out. No answer. What the fuck? I asked. What just happened? I don't know, Haley answered. The signal disappeared. Lee, vitals? Same thing, answered Lee, leaning forward and scanning his screen. One second, I could read him loud and clear. The next thing, nothing. What do we do? I asked. We've got, what, three hours till the Chinese get here? Haley was fiddling with the radio, trying to regain contact. I, I don't know. She answered me over her shoulder. If we can't get him back on the radio, we'll have to send someone down after him. They can't find him down there. It's evidence that we were here. I cursed under my breath. For some reason, I didn't want to go down into the water after Thomas. The way he had sounded before his signal had suddenly gone dead. Somehow, it scared me badly. The radio crackled to life. Haley whooped and Lee grinned. Thomas, Thomas, do you read me? Haley asked. Uh, I read you. Thomas answered. I frowned. Something about his voice or his intonation seemed off. Like he was doing his best to remain calm, but only just managing it. What's happening down there? I asked. Did you find the objective? No, no, nothing down here. I'm coming back now. Prepare to winch me up. There it was again. Unmistakable this time. Thomas' voice had changed somehow. He sounded strained, afraid, even. I looked over at my friends. The grins they had been wearing a few seconds ago were gone. You hear it too? I asked quietly. Yeah, answered Lee. Is he, is he all right? Thomas, this is Haley, my friend radio. Is everything good down there? You sound different. Yes, I'm fine. Thomas answered. He was lying, we could tell. At the winch now, voice me up. Lee looked up at us. After a second's hesitation, I nodded. He triggered the winch controls and the grinding of machinery filled the ship. 
We waited in silence, the air ripe with unease. Thomas was acting strangely. That much was clear. He denied it, but we could tell from his voice. Lee looked up from his computer. His vitals are elevated, he said. His heart is beating way too fast. When did it start? I asked, leaning over to have a look. Ever since we re-established contact, since then he's been 20-30% about the normal for a dive like this? What the hell is happening down there? Haley muttered to herself. On the radio, Thomas was silent, clicking his tummy patiently the whole time. His depth rating went up as he neared our ship. Finally, he exited the control room and went up into the deck. The sea parted as the bulky shape of Thomas's diving suit broke the surface, streaming water behind it. The winch raised him up over the deck, then lowered him to his feet. I started forward to help him remove the helmet, but Thomas took a step back. Thomas, what? I began, confused. I, I think I'll keep the suit on for now, he said, his voice hollow but firm. He looked at me unblinkingly. I realized he was dead serious. I frowned in confusion. What? Why? I'm keeping it on. He repeated. Is everything alright, Thomas? Lee asked carefully. What happened down there? Thomas was standing for a split second, almost imperceptibly. Nothing. He answered finally. The objective wasn't there. Must have been destroyed when the ship sank. Just an empty box. I cursed. This was bad. Our employers would not be happy about this. Lee moved forward towards Thomas, hands outstretched to the diving suit's helmet. Come on, man. Let's get you out of that suit. No! Thomas stomped, pushing Lee back with a shove. His face was twisted in an expression of anger mixed with desperation. A chill ran down my back. Thomas pushed past us and stomped across the deck, heading down the stairs and into the bowels of the ship. Lee, Haley, and I glanced at each other. What the hell is he doing? Lee asked finally. I shrugged helplessly. I have no idea, man. Something's wrong, though. Really wrong. Well, let's just try and keep calm, Haley said. I'll try and do some magic on the computer. Find out what happened when the radio went dead. Lee, make us ready to get underway. I want to be far, far away from here when the government arrives. John, get below deck find Thomas and try to find out what the hell happened down there. My anxiety abated somewhat. She was right. Something strange was going on, but we needed to stay cool if we wanted to make sense of it all. Lee rushed off to prepare the ship for our departure. Haley patted my shoulder reassuringly and ducked into the control room. Taking a deep breath, I stepped down the stairs and into the ship. It didn't take me long to locate Thomas. Our ship wasn't very big and he had left a trail of water behind him. I found him in a storage room, sitting on top of a large container, back against the wall. Hey man, I said, trying to fake a calmness I didn't feel. Everything all right? He looked up at me. His eyes were wild, darting around the room. Yeah, John, I'm good. So, uh, what's with the suit, man? I asked, trying to sound nonchalant. I didn't know if he was thinking straight. The last thing I wanted to do was provoke some violent reaction by scaring him or, or sounding threatening. Thomas brought his hand up in front of him. I may have to go back down once the people in charge find out we didn't retrieve anything. Might as well be prepared for it. As he talked, he moved his hands in front of himself, mimicking the motion of writing on a piece of paper. I looked up. His eyes were desperate, pleading. Yeah, uh, sounds good, I said absently, my mind racing, trying to figure out what he was trying to tell me. Thomas's hand kept moving, writing on the non-existent piece of paper. Understanding hit me like a flash of light. I rummaged around in my pockets, looking for the items he wanted. Someone should call them, tell them what's up, Thomas continued, hands never stopping their silent movement. Finally, I produced a folded sheet of paper and a stub of a pencil. I handed them to him. He began writing, the gloves of the diving suit making him clumsy. His eyes never left me. You sure that you're right, Thomas? I asked again, trying to feel the silence. He slid the piece of paper towards me, smiling forcefully. 
Never better. I looked down at the writing. It said, Help me. It's in my suit. Part 2. I'm a deep sea diver working for a criminal ring. Something has gone very, very wrong on our last mission. My heart skipped a beat as I read the words Thomas had written. I looked up at him. His eyes were pleading. Okay, man, I- I'm going up. I'll see what I can do about that phone call. I said, hoping he'd get my message. Thomas nodded in understanding. All right, I'll stay right here. I sprinted out of the room, heart hammering, and ran to the control room. Lee and Haley were already there. We have a... I started, not even knowing how to explain what had happened. Haley cut me off. Thomas was passing us a message while we were winching him up. I stopped in my tracks, head spinning. Everything was coming apart faster than I could comprehend. What? How? What message? The clicking. It seemed strange to me. Thomas is usually so calm and collected. It seemed so unlike him. She gestured at the computer screen. I listened through it again. It was Morse code, John. He was clicking in Morse, spelling out a sentence. What what was he saying? Lee answered me instead of Haley. Don't bring me up. Don't bring me up. It just repeats the whole damn journey. All the way up, he was telling us to leave him at the bottom of the sea. We were hoping you got some sense out of him. Haley continued, looking at me. Something must have scared him down there. He's not thinking straight. I took a deep breath. Trying to steady myself. I think something bad happened down there, I said finally. Thomas says he's alright, but he wrote this. I handed them the piece of paper. Haley went pale. Lee frowned, but I saw a flash of fear in his eyes. What the hell does this mean? There's something in his suit? How would... So he said nothing wrong but passed you this? Said Haley. Why would he do that? I don't know. I admitted. None of this makes sense. But I think that, whatever it is, he can't tell us anything out loud. He wrote this message down. He sent us a message in Morse on the way up. Maybe... Maybe something's really got into his suit. And if he tries to warn us, it'll hurt him. Lee snorted derisively. (laughs) Can you hear yourself, John? Something got in his suit? What the hell does that mean? How would it even get through the seals? I don't know, Lee. I repeated. Maybe he's just... I don't know, gone a bit crazy? Nitrogen narcosis, perhaps? Haley shook her head. Nitrogen narcosis doesn't do anything like this. What are you suggesting we do then? Lee asked. He was still skeptical, and I couldn't blame him. This was insane. Still, I couldn't forget the way Thomas had sounded afraid of something before his radio cut out. Like... He had seen something horrifying. What's the plan? Lee asked, breaking me out of my thought. We only have about two more hours before the Chinese arrive. Get us out of here, Haley decided. We've got enough problems already without having to deal with the government. Me and John will figure out what to do about Thomas. Lee glanced at me, then headed out of the control room and to the ship's bridge. I looked over at Haley. So, uh, what's the plan? She shrugged. I don't know, John. Could something have gotten inside his suit? And what could make him behave like this anyway? No idea. The way he sounded before his radio went dead, though. Like he'd seen something terrible. I heard it too, Haley said. He sounded scared. Horrified. I've never heard Thomas like that. Me neither. We'll make way for the mainland, Haley decided finally. The higher-ups will know what to do. In the meantime, we'll try to find out more from Thomas. 
So are we really entertaining the possibility that there's something inside his suit? Haley looked me in the eye. He's having an episode. Until we can get him professional help, we'll play into the delusion. She sounded resolute, but I caught a spark of something in her eye. Fear? Doubt? She wasn't quite convinced by her own words. We made our way down to the cargo hold. Thomas was still sitting on his container. As we entered, his eyes darted up, full of desperate hope. I held up a piece of paper we had prepared with Haley before entering. Written on it in large letters was the message, On way to land. Help there. What is it? Thomas' eyes flicked across the page, almost imperceptibly. He shook his head. I laid the paper and pencil down in front of him. We've been recalled to the mainland, I said, trying to sound calm. Thomas nodded at me. He was writing something, but I couldn't make out what. Have you told them there was nothing to recover? He said absently, trying to keep the conversation going. No, Haley answered. We haven't called yet. Thomas' gaze flicked up from the paper, then back down. He slid it across towards us. I can't wait to be back on land, he said. On the paper, Thomas had scribbled a single sentence underlined and traced several times. Don't take me ashore. I glanced sideways at Haley. Thomas, maybe we should... I started. Thomas spasmed suddenly, bending forward as if punched in the stomach. I started forward, grabbing his shoulder to steady him and... Something moved beneath my hand. With horrible strength, Thomas's arm bent backwards away from me, as if pulled by an unseen force. There was a wet crack, and the whole limb bent into an unnatural angle. I gasped and took a step back. Thomas's eyes snapped to me, a silent command to stay still. I froze. Haley quietly pointed at Thomas's shoulder with a shaking finger. Where I had touched it, the diving suit had bulged outwards, a full two inches of the suit blossoming into a swaying, undulating mass. I recoiled in disgust. The lump pulsed organically before retracting as quickly as it had appeared. Thomas had gone a sickly white. He tapped his one functional hand on the message, then took the pencil and wrote out another phrase. Help me. Will... Uh, we'll let you know when we're getting close. Haley stammered, backing away from him. I followed her, never taking my eyes off Thomas. He was grimacing, whether in pain or fear, I didn't know. We stumbled into the corridor and slammed the heavy door shut behind us. What the fuck was that? Haley whispered to me. What the fuck was that? I don't know. I mumbled, my heart hammering. There's... Uh, there's really something in that suit with him. Uh, I could feel it when I touched him. What could possibly do that? Haley asked incredulously. I have no clue. What do we do now? We go tell Lee. Then... We'll figure something out. We headed up to the deck and onto the bridge. Night had fallen. Lee had got in the ship underway in the meantime heading toward the closest port. He looked up at us when we entered. So, what's the situation? Stumbling over our words, we explained what had happened. Lee's face remained blank as we described the strange organic protrusion on Thomas' suit and showed him the message he had written for us. So, you think there's really something in the suit? He asked at last. Yes, I answered. We saw it. It was moving. It was fucking moving, Lee. It broke his arm when I touched it. Our friend sat down on his heels and rubbed his eyes. Shit! Shit! What are we thinking, Lee? What do we do? Well, we can't take him to land. For whatever reason, he seems to think that's a bad idea. So, we have to deal with this here. We need to find out what's in there with him, Haley said. We can't do anything if we don't know that. 
How do we go about that, though? I asked. We can't talk about it, and he can't just keep writing stuff down. We can barely get short sentences out of him as it is. We were silent for a while, weighing our options. Finally, Lee spoke up. There's nothing for it. Someone will have to just ask him. Do you really think that's a good idea? Haley said. He hasn't said anything out loud. There must be a reason. I can't think of anything better to do, Lee admitted. We need to find out more, and pen and paper aren't going to cut it. What if it isn't safe? Whatever it is, it hasn't gotten out of the suit yet. Maybe it can't. It might be perfectly safe, and besides, it's not like Thomas can be in more danger. We'll have to risk it. What if it escapes? I said. Once I'm inside, you seal the door behind me. When the room is secure, I'll ask him. If I need to get out, I'll beat on the door. That way you'll know it's safe to open up. And what if it isn't safe? I asked. Then, then I'll just have to deal with it. Lee answered. His hand strayed to his belt, where he had a small pistol holstered. Haley put a hand on his shoulder. Are you sure about this? Absolutely. We have to help Thomas, but we can't do that if we don't know what's in there with him. We headed down to the cargo hold. My heart was hammering, and my mouth was dry. Haley was pale. Lee appeared calm, but I could tell he was barely keeping it together. We stopped in front of the door to Thomas' room. Good luck, I whispered. Don't worry, he said, flashing me a hollow smile. I'll be right back. He opened the heavy steel door and stepped inside. I caught a glimpse of Thomas, still sitting on the container. His head was bent low. Lee looked back at us and nodded. I swung the door shut and sealed it, then turned to Haley. What now? Now, we wait. We could hear Lee speaking on the other side, but the thick walls reduced his speech to an unintelligible murmur. I cleared my throat. throat) How will we? A scream from the cargo hold cut me off. I recognized the voice. He was Lee, his voice twisted with unimaginable terror, shouting wordlessly. An impact, then another. Then another made the door to the cargo hold shake. I realized what it was. Lee was desperately beating on the door. Let me out! Let me out! The shout carried even through the metal walls. With shaking fingers, I unsealed the door. It swung open and Lee fumbled through, falling to the ground and crawling away. In the hold, I caught a glimpse of Thomas. He was no longer sitting on the container. He had fallen onto the ground, and I yelled in horror at the sight of what was happening to him. He's whole body was moving, writhing, and stretching in ways no body should ever move. His outline was barely human, contorted with tumorous growths under the diving suit. His arms and legs were twisting in an unnatural angles. The crack of bones sent bile to my throat. Close the door! Close it! Haley's command woke me from my terrified reverie. I pushed on the heavy metal door and it slammed shut, sealing Thomas away. I stumbled back. Lee jumped to his feet, eyes darting and wild. He pushed past me and Haley and leapt up the staircase. Oh God, oh my God, I whispered to myself, too shocked to think. John, John, keep it together, Haley said, shaking me by the shoulders. I didn't care. Oh God. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Haley slapped me, and the pain achieved what words couldn't. Did did you see that? I asked, voice quaking. I don't know what I saw, Haley answered. What the fuck were the Chinese transporting? What, What do you mean? I asked. Don't you understand? A government ship sinks. They don't bother to send a rescue party but they get a salvage operation going in record time? The Yao Hai was carrying something, something secret, something dangerous. It got free or escaped or whatever when the ship sank. 
And then, Thomas went down. A loud bang interrupted her. My heart fell as I realized what it was. A gunshot. I rushed upward, Haley right behind me. We stopped in our tracks as we reached the deck and saw what lay there. Lee was sprawled on the ground, blood pouring from his temple and steaming in the cold night air. Brain matter had sprayed into the wall beside him. The gun had fallen from his fingers and lay on the ground next to the corpse. I fell to my knees in disbelief. Haley rushed to the side of the ship and vomited into the water. He... He... What? I mumbled, not quite comprehending. Haley dropped to the ground next to me. Lee, no. Oh my god, Lee. A sound interrupted my grief, sending my heart plummeting. From the stairs behind us came the thump of heavy metal shod footsteps pulling themselves up to the deck. A shape dragged itself into view. It stumbled on ruined legs. It dragged itself by shattered arms. It crawled on all four like a demented insect, its whole mass pulsing and twisting and writhing underneath the heavy diving suit. A single word, guttural and twisted, escaped its lips. Thomas had escaped. I'm a deep sea diver working for a criminal ring. Something has gone very, very wrong on our last mission. Part 3 I staggered backwards from the bloated thing edging closer. My mind was screaming at me to run, to escape, but it was as if my limbs were made of lead. John! Screamed Haley. The name tore me from my terrified stupor. I stumbled back, her cry releasing my frozen limbs. Flee. Flee. That one word, that one concept was all I knew. I turned and there was nowhere to run. We were on a ship. Miles of moonlit water stretched away in every direction, and jumping overboard was suicide. The only way from Thomas was below deck, but he, it, stood blocking the only way down. We backed away from it, knocking into the deck railing. Nowhere to run. The Thomas thing dragged itself closer. I couldn't see his face, shrouded in the dark of his helmet. Haley held up her hands as if to ward the thing away. Thomas, please. It groaned, stumbling towards us. Something snapped in my mind. Flight was not an option. Fight took over. I screamed in rage and terror and jumped forward, lashing out with my fists at the thick glass faceplate covering Thomas's head. I didn't even get close. It grabbed me in its malformed arms, drawing me closer in a demented mockery of an embrace, bringing my face to its own. I saw something move in the deep shadow there, something that might have once been human, but wasn't any longer. Haley saved me. Before I could see more, she pulled desperately at my shoulders. I slipped from the thing's grip. It stumbled for a second, off balance. Down! She yelled. Below deck! She slipped past the thing in Thomas' suit as it staggered. I leapt after her, narrowly avoiding a grasping hand that seemed to swell and extend, only just missing me. And then we were below deck, stumbling through the dark metal corridor. In here! I yelled, pointing at the abandoned control room. We fell inside, slamming the door shut behind us. I dragged the metal cabinet in front of it, blocking the room off. Heavy footsteps echoed down the corridor. We held our breath. The door shook suddenly as a terrible force struck it. Haley buried her face in her hands. The door shook again and again. Then, silence. We waited with bated breath. We could hear the thing on the other side. The sound of its demented shuffling. The straining of the suit as whatever was beneath it stretched and twisted. 
the footsteps came again, this time receding. It staggered away, making its slow way up the stairs and onto the deck. I breathed a sigh of relief. Healy crawled over to me. Are you alright? Did it hurt you? She asked. I think... I think I'm alright. I answered, checking myself. A chill ran down my back as I realized I'd almost seen the thing's face. Lee had seen it, and it had driven him to suicide. What the hell do we do? I asked. There's no way out of this room. No rations, no water, nothing. We're trapped. Let's try to think. What do we have? We looked around, taking stock of the situation. Three computers. A radio linked to Thomas' diving suit. Winch controls. Perfect if we want to send someone down. Not that helpful right now. I said finally. Haley rubbed her eyes and took a deep breath. We need to get in contact with the higher ups. This has gone way beyond our control. I nodded. I was hoping we'd manage this alone. They won't be happy about this. Not really an option anymore, though. Fuck them! Haley said with feeling. They must have known what we were looking for. They knew the dangers and they chose not to tell us. We finished this. And then, I'm done with them. She pulled out her phone and punched in a number. I heard the dial tone. After a few seconds, someone picked up. Status. Came a voice, heavily accented from the other side. This is Haley. We need help. Right now. Status. The voice repeated. Is the objective secure? There's no objective, damn you! Haley swore. Before tonight, none of us would have dared speak like that to our employers. Now, it didn't seem like something to worry about. Whatever was aboard the Yao Hai, it escaped. She carried on. It's taken... It's taken Thomas. Lee is dead. Jonathan and me are taking cover in the control room. We need help right now. There was no answer. In the background, we could hear several voices speaking rapidly in Chinese. I didn't understand their words, but it sounded like an argument. Hello? Hello? Haley asked angrily. Did you hear us? We need help right now. The voices squabbled on. I grabbed a phone from Haley's hands. My temper had run out. What the fuck was aboard the Yao Hai? Tell me, goddammit! The arguing stopped. Sure, go The voice said. The line went dead. Damn it! Haley yelled, throwing the phone away. So that's it? I said incredulously. After years and years, that's it? They're just abandoning us? Cowards! Haley hissed. They don't even have the balls to tell us what it is, let alone save us from their own mistakes. How the hell do we stop this thing? I asked incredulously. We don't even know what it is. How do we stop it? I looked over at Haley. Her face was thoughtful, concentrated. A burst of hope penetrated the fog of desperation that had fallen on me. You've got a plan, don't you? It'll be dangerous, she admitted. There's no certainty it will work. And even if it does, we may not survive. It can't be worse than what we're dealing with right now. I answered, crawling over to her. What are you thinking? The thing is still in the suit, she said. It can't get out. I don't know why, but if it could, it would be out already. Maybe it's bound to Thomas's body somehow, I said. Yeah, that might be it. Whatever the reason, I think it needs to stay above water. If it wanted to be in the sea, there's nothing stopping it from just jumping overboard. It's staying here, though. Why? Why would it stay? Maybe it wants to get to dry land. Maybe it can't escape the suit on its own and it needs someone to get it out. I really don't know, but whatever the reason, we can exploit it. How? It's gone above deck now. We sneak out, get to the engine room. I'll prime the fuel tanks to explode. Once that's done, we sprint onto the deck and jump overboard before it can get us. Ship goes down, that thing goes down with it. 
Despite the situation, I raised my eyebrow in mock surprise. Where did you learn how to rig ships to explode? Haley smiled grimly and tapped her nose. I have to keep some secrets, right? I stood up and began pacing the room, running through the plan in my head. What if it follows us into the water? I asked. It can't. The suit will drag it to the bottom of the sea if it tries. There's life vests here, I said. That'll give us more of a chance in the water. Exactly, Haley answered. We know the government has ships somewhere in this area. Once the engines blow up, they might come investigate. They might pick us up. We just need to stay afloat for a few hours. And if they don't? Haley shrugged. If we stay here, we'll die. At least this way, we have a chance. I was still for a few seconds. Finally, I nodded. Let's do it then. Slowly, trying not to make any sound, we dragged the cabinet away from the door. Every sound seemed terribly loud, starting to draw attention. We listened intently for any sound that might suggest we'd been detected. No stomping of heavy metal boots. No sound of the thing dragging itself down the stairs. Nothing. Let's go, I whispered. Silently, we unsealed the door and swung it open. The corridor was dark as we crept down it. Every shadow held the threat of death. Every sound seemed to echo through the ship like an alarm. Somehow, we reached the engine room without incident. Keep watch, Healy hissed at me. This will take a while. She crept away into the dark towards the massive diesel generators and fuel tanks that powered our ship. Everything was silent. I crouched in the shadows, eyes on the door, heart hammering. Somewhere behind me, Haley was rummaging among the machinery for tools and material. I willed her to move faster. It seemed like hours passed, even though it was only a few minutes. Once, I heard the footsteps of the thing in Thomas's suit. Somewhere above us, I waited with bated breath, but the thing died off slowly. Finally, I heard Haley creep over to me. All done, she whispered. We've got two minutes till this blows. We have to move. We set off through the dark. The stairs above deck loomed in front of us, illuminated by moonlight like a stairway to heaven. It was strangely beautiful. One minute left, Haley hissed. Ready to make a run for it? Yeah, let's do this. On three then. One, two, three. We leapt forward, jumping up the first two steps. I could see the sky. We were so close to... Something huge suddenly loomed above us. The light of the moon was cut off. I screamed in shock and fell backwards down the stairs, crawling desperately away from it. Haley was not so fortunate. She cried out in pain as the thing caught her, wrapping her into a demented embrace. It whispered something I couldn't hear. Haley's screams doubled in terror. I ran. I wish I had stayed. I wish I had tried to help my friend. I'm not proud of it, but I ran like a coward. The only way up was blocked, and so my brain, fueled by instincts older than man, drove me back to the last place of safety I knew. As I ran into the control room, the entire ship shook with a massive blast. I lost my footing and fell to the ground, striking my head against the metal floor. Everything spun around me. Haley's screams stopped abruptly. Crawling on all fours, dazed and disoriented, I slammed the door shut and sealed it, and then dropped to the ground, sobbing with fear and shame. The ship groaned around me. I could feel it moving, listing, taking on water. The sound of rushing water came through the walls. I've been listening to that sound for quite some time. It won't be long now. The ship will slip beneath the waves. The dark will rush in. And then it'll all be over. I'm writing this on the one surviving computer in the control room. I guess it's my epitaph or perhaps a confession on my cowardice. I wasn't a good person, but I want someone to know what happened out here. 
I want someone to know how my friends died. And perhaps I want someone to remember me too. I have put this story into the cloud and set it to publish as soon as possible. Hopefully, someone will read it. Someone will remember us. I never wanted to go out by drowning. No deep sea diver does. It's a horrible, painful death. But now, it doesn't seem so bad. In fact, that's what I'm hoping for. Because there's an alternative. I can hear Thomas. The thing that was Thomas through the door. Wow, Jonathan. He croons and gargles. Come out. I'm ready. I'm ready to take the suit off. <laughs>